but we're going to have a giant restructuring of the of the IOUs and hey what's up guys Recently, I have been reading and listening a lot of Ray Dalio's articles and interviews trying to connect the dots together and I might be on something. In this video, I will give you a quick economic update and then Ray Dalio will explain how we are going to restructure upcoming new economy and what does that mean to you. This chart represents the Empire State Manufacturing Survey, which is produced each month by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It provides an indication of how manufacturing activity operates in the state economy. The red line represents expected manufacturing activity and the blue line represents real manufacturing activity. This data goes all the way back till 2001. As we see in this chart, business activity in New York State plunged all the way down to minus 78. It's the lowest level in the history of the survey by the wide margin. The expected business activity was at 7, so there is a huge difference between expected and real activity. It means major businesses stop working. It's way worse than what we have seen in 2008 housing bubble. Back then, manufacturing activities dropped to minus 33 points. Right now it's more than double, so you do the math. Let's take a look at another chart. On Thursday, Labor Department resembled new unemployment numbers for last week. New additional 5.2 million people filed for unemployment insurance claim just last week, although smaller than 6.6 .6 million people who applied the week before and the record 6.9 million people who applied the week that ended on March 28. The eye-popping job losses in the past month have erased virtually all 22.8 million jobs gained since 2010 as nation rebounded from 2008 Great Recession. If you look at the bigger picture for the past 100 years, in 2008 Great Recession, unemployment rate was under 10%. In 1980s, unemployment rate was slightly under 10%. The biggest unemployment rate was during 1929 Great Depression, it was about 20%. Two economists say that US unemployment rate right now is already over 20%. According to Alexander Brick of Arizona State University and Adam Blind of Virginia Commonwealth University who are tracking the real data in real time. It is expected to remain close to 20% through the end of the year, meaning 2 in 10 people would still be out of work at holidays. But you may probably say, yeah yeah who cares about unemployment, stock market is up, it means they are doing something right. Well. Not really. There is a big difference between stock market and economy. You can think of a stock market as a lagging indicator based on what is going on in our economy. As Ray Dalio describes, the most important driver of economy is GDP growth. As of today, the total market index is at close to $30 trillion, which is about 132.4% of the total last reported quarter GDP. The US stock market is positioned for an average annualized return of minus 0.3%, estimated from historical valuation of the stock market. The US is expected to account for 34% of this year decline in the world GDP, according to Bloomberg calculation. Let's take a look at recent Ray Dalio interview and why he believes this cycle comes to the end. If I can take a minute, I'd like to just paint a template for you that takes us, you know, over the last thousand years, the things that have happened over and over again, there is one pattern that I'd like to convey. May I take a moment and do that? Absolutely. There are four things that are the driving forces of our economy and our lifestyle and wealth. And the first and most powerful is, is, is productivity which comes from people learning and inventing and doing things well just as Marco described, okay? And it grows slowly, you know, one or two or three percent a year, it grows slowly and it's not volatile because knowledge isn't volatile, but it grows and that raises our living standards over a period of time. Then there's a short-term debt cycle. The short-term debt cycle is, you know, recessions and expansions and booms and recessions, that. 
that they last about eight, 10 years. And then there's a long-term debt cycle. And that long-term debt cycle, which goes on about once every 50 to 75 years, is when you begin a new type of money and a new type of credit. That began in 1945, the new world order at the end of World War II, and with the Bretton Woods monetary system, created a new monetary system in 1945, a new money. So they wiped out pretty much the old money or they largely disposed of it and they began anew and that's the new world order which was the American world order and we have seen it and still 70% of the money and credit that exists in the economy is running by dollars and what you have traditionally is the breakdown. And then the fourth influence is politics and politics is largely how we deal with each other. Can't, and, and there's internal politics and there's external politics. The internal politics is how do you deal with uh, the wealth gap? How do you deal with the values gap? Do you have a common mission? Do we have an American dream that we can agree on and that we're pursuing that together? Or do you fight over wealth and, and so on? And so when you look at history, that's what revolutions are in their various ways. And there's always a revolution in one of these. Sometimes those are peaceful revolutions and so sometimes they're disruptive. In, like in, and, but it's a wealth ch shift in, uh, that needs to take place. So in 19, what, uh, the Roosevelt shifted policies and changed taxes and so on in that way. And then in other countries, there was the turning over democracy. Um, Hitler came to power because of that gap. So how people deal with each other internally. There's also external politics. So that politics means between countries. And you have a situation when there's a rising power challenging existing power. There is competition and there is a risk of war. And so how they deal with each other, so that they're, whether there's a greater good or whether they are um, fighting with each other is the defining moment. There are always stress tests, these big stress tests that come along once about once every 75 years and, and when they happen. And this is a stress test. And I think that what you're going to see is uh, as how we deal with each other. There's enough wealth to go around, but what do you do when you're outside the ring of support, uh, let's say of the, of the US dollar? And what, what is that gonna be like for those entities? Or if you're within the ring of support, how will that bill be divided? And how will we be with each other? I think we're gonna to have to reconsider who has what? what, what is it about education and so on. So that's what we're in, I think. Number one, productivity growth. Learning, inventing, doing things well. Grow slowly, one to 3% per year, not volatile. Raises living standards. As I mentioned earlier, the stock market is way above GDP growth. GDP is expected to drop by more than 30% on the second quarter of 2020. Number 2. Short-term debt cycle. Boom and bust. Last about 8 to 10 years on average. This is what we have seen during 2000's dot-com bubble and 2008 global financial crisis. Now, this current short-term debt cycle is well overdue. We were in the bull market for more than 11 years. Number 3. Long-term debt cycle. 50 to 75 years. New type of money in credit. Last one began in 1945 Bretton Woods system. That's more than 70 years ago. Considering the fact that Federal Reserve balance sheet is expense exponentially as QE infinity kicked in, US dollar will lose its purchasing power more and more rapidly. Therefore, we might be at the beginning of the new monetary system, new money. And I don't think we're going back to gold. Number 4. How we deal with each other. Domestic and international politics. On domestic politics, there is a huge wealth gap. The top 0.1% of American household hold the same amount of wealth as the bottom 90%. There is no middle class. It's a lie. You are wealthy or you are poor, as simple as that. Let's take a look at what Ray Dalio has to say about rebuilding new economy. These things happen pretty quickly. Um, 
they're, they last maybe a couple of three years in terms of that process. And then you have a rebuilding and they're dealt with, um, with creativity. The sort of, the greatest force through time is inventiveness, human inventiveness, adaptability. So you're going to see these restructurings happen and you're going to see the kind of inventiveness that you just saw from Marco, okay? And it's the power of that adaptation that is the greatest power. I did a, a study, which is on LinkedIn, if anyone wants to see it, and it takes, um, it goes back 500 years, and it shows um, um, real GDP, uh, in other words, the economic activity going back there. And, and there's a line, and you don't see these depressions, as we're calling them, even on that line. They barely wiggles. When you go into it and you look at the that piece, that's what it looks like. GDP falls 10%, unemployment goes up, it, and it passes. And because the greatest force is the force of adaptation and inventiveness if we can operate well together. So that's what I think it's going to look like over this period of time. It'll pass. It, the world will be very different. There'll be a new world order, but it will pass and we'll be inventive because what we're dealing with now is just money and credit. Money and credit is just digital. I mean, there's no, there is real good services, you know, those are real, but everything else is just accounting. And so when you change the digits and you work those things out and you work yourself through, that takes, you know, a couple of years at most kind of, and then you come back into a restructured environment. And it, it could be said that it is really healthy in many ways because it is a stress test. Because if you look at history, people have gotten, sometimes they get weaker or they're not prepared to, in many ways, uh, weaker in terms of maybe they don't build enough savings and they operate that, or maybe they emphasize luxuries over necessities. It's a reorienting type of experience that in many ways makes us healthy, even appreciating the basics of life. But we're gonna have a giant restructuring of the, of the IOUs and we're gonna work out when hospitals um, are, can go broke because this is terribly costly for hospitals and they will not fully recover their losses. Hospitals will go broke, even though we know that they need them. So when you go, you have to go entity by entity through this, and then you'll go through the process of who will pay. So this is not, you know, some people mistake this as um, there is a, a, a virus and the virus may come and go, okay? Maybe we never see it again. I don't think that's likely, but I mean, the people who tell me say, but who knows? But if it never came back again, there will be those who are broke and, and, and who will have loss of income. We're going to change how we operate in a, in a way. The, the supply lines are going to change. In other words, self-sufficiency. What is self-sufficiency now going to mean? Do we have enough of this and that? We're going to restructure our economy and restructure the financial system in ways that we mean we are not going to go back to the way it was. As Ray Dalio said, the greatest force to rebuild the economy is inventiveness and adaptability. New money, new IOU, which means IOU, is basically that creation. So if we connect the dots together, it looks like there is a long-term debt cycle comes to the end, which means new monetary system will take place. But what is the most innovative thing happened for the past decade? Take a minute and think about it. Gold? No. Bitcoin and blockchain-based cryptocurrencies. Could Bitcoin become new reserve currency? Honestly, I don't think it's going to happen. But in the world of money and credit market, there is over $90 trillion. If Bitcoin would take 10% of the entire money market, it would be over $9 trillion of market capitalization. The same as gold. Which means one BTC would be close to half a million dollars. I don't think measuring in US dollar would even make sense in that point. It's better to measure Bitcoin relatively to gold and silver. So, if you want to be ahead of the curve, some Bitcoin in your portfolio would not hurt. 
Let me know what do you guys think about Ray Dalio and new economic restructure. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, hit that like button and subscribe.